Okay, welcome to module four. Today we're talking about component theory and operation. We're basically going to go over several electrical components, talk a little bit about their theory and operation. So let's get started. Our objectives are to learn about various components, including the basic five. So you remember the five basic components every circuit needs we talked about a few weeks ago? We're going to add to that. Uh, we're going to add capacitors and diodes. And then we're going to talk about coils, solenoids, relays, two-wire sensors, three-wire sensors, and transistors. And the uh, goal today is just to talk about what the components look like, physically and the schematic representation of what they look like, and talk a little bit about operation and theory. Uh, next week, we'll start talking about some diagnosis, and then uh, I'll build some circuits for you. So here's the basic five. <clears throat> Remember when we talked about uh, intro to series and parallel circuits, and we talked about the five main uh, components that every circuit has to have. Of course, you remember the battery, there's a circuit protection device, the control device, load, and conductors. Um, the battery basically is electrical storage device, right? Uh, uses a, a chemical um, chemistry to create electricity, uh, potential electricity between two dissimilar metals. Uh, basically, you have an abundance of electrons on one and absence of electrons on the other plate. Um, it's used again to store and filter out electricity. So kind of on demand, think starter, um, you know, it's sitting there ready to engage electric starter to start compressing the engine, to start the four stroke process, the intake compression power exhaust, right? Um, tech tip, always be sure to check the battery before any diagnosis. I know this sounds obvious and redundant, <clears throat> but you would, uh, you'd be surprised who doesn't check the battery first. So again, first thing I would check is make sure you're, you know, you're uh, got 12 volts, and you got a good battery before you move on to any electrical diagnosis. And then we have circuit protection device. These components basically centralize failures. Uh, it could be a fuse, circuit breaker, or fusible uh, was a leak, link. Sorry, I need to edit that. That's a link. Uh, those are rare. Down on the picture here at the bottom, you see on the left, those are various fuses. We have um, old glass fuses, porcelain fuses. These are like European cars. These are old American cars. Here's some more modern fuses right here. Um, basically, again, these are kind of weak links. They're designed to, to, to blow under a certain amount of current. What that does is it centralizes the failure and also prevents the harness from melting. Uh, right here in the middle, we have a circuit breaker. This is kind of like a fuse. It protects the circuit, circuit, but instead of blowing, it has two dissimilar metals that are bonded together. And when a certain amount of heat's reached based on current going through it, the two metals uh, ex expand at different rates and it opens up the circuit. When it cools, it closes the circuit, completing the circuit again. If the problem still exists, <coughs> excuse me, well then it just um, it just opens up again. Over here, these are fusible links and you're like, well, they look like wires. That's, that's right, they are basically wires. They're really hard to find. They're kind of hard to diagnose because they're hidden so well. Uh, basically pulling them, they're kind of stretchy uh, if they're blown. Uh, again, inside there, it's just a design failure. The point of all these components is to centralize the failure and to protect the harness and components from either melting, catching on fire, damage, etc. Um, here again, here's a schematic representation of a fuse, and here's a schematic of a circuit breaker. So after the battery's been checked, uh, check these. I like to use a 12-volt test light and just go down the fuse box and make sure that they're all good. Uh, you know, key on and you're checking a fuse box. Uh, the top of the fuse has those little metal tabs. You can check that with a 12 volt test light. When the if the 12 volt test light is hooked up to the battery ground, when you touch the top of the fuse, if it has power, it'll light up the light. And so both sides should light up. That tells you the fuse is good. If one side lights up and the other side does not, the fuse is more than likely blown. Um, I wouldn't take them out and look at them visually. Sometimes that could be misleading. So just a word of advice. Uh, then you have your control device. These are switches. You know, this is what you use to operate the circuit, turn it on or off. Uh, switch, relay, transistor, etc. We're going to talk about relays and transistors later. Uh, this is a common wear item. You know, check these after the fuses. So you check the battery, make sure you got 12 volts. Um, you know, make sure it's charging. Make sure that you have <clears throat> the um, fuses are good. Make sure they're not blown. And then make sure your switches are working. You know, and again, just look at a switch. You have Remember, load to ground and switch to ground. So some switches control the ground, some switches control the power. So look at your schematic. That's your roadmap. If it controls power, then you need to make sure power is going through the switch when it's on. And if it controls ground, you want to make sure that you have power up to the switch, you know, 12 volts up to it, 
and zero past it when it's open and when you turn on the switch or close the switch you should have 0.1 or less all the way through it and that's on a ground side switch uh, you can use your voltmeter to determine that all right now we got the load this is the purpose of the circuit this is what you're trying to operate it could be light solenoid motor heater etc this is basically the whole purpose of the electrical circuit <clears throat> and this item should consume most of the voltage drop that the circuit has outside of a little bit of resistance and switches and wires and the conductors <clears throat> these are the wires that connect everything right uh, here's some typical faults if you look at the picture here some pressure marks and some chafing some rubbing you'll see this on factory vehicles uh, pretty common uh, um, right here this loom going down the transmission looks like on this vehicle there's some chafing going on right here this can rub through inside causing um, one of the basic uh, fault categories right here open high resistance or short okay those are the main things we're looking at and we'll uh, again next week we'll talk more about diagnosing these kind of faults capacitors uh, these components quickly store and discharge electrical energy they are used to smooth out voltage spikes known as highs and valleys known as lows uh, always assume they are charged these can be lethal so don't uh, don't play around with these uh, this is a schematic symbol for a standard capacitor electrolytic capacitor and adjustable capacitor okay uh, diodes these are like electrical check valves they allow current to go one way but not the other we talked a little bit about this when we talked about alternator operation again these little diodes right here will let the current go this way but not that way some diodes such as zener diodes allow current to go in the reverse direction uh, at a specified range but um, yeah we don't use those a whole lot uh, for automotive purposes they use kind of voltage regulators <clears throat> coils anytime current flows through a conductor we know that it creates electromagnetic field I had mentioned that before so again we're sending current through a conductor that creates a magnetic field around that conductor basically useless but if we coil up that conductor so we take that wire wrap it up in a coil those magnetic fields uh, build on each other okay and then they end up creating a larger magnetic field that is usable so this enhanced field we use to do work such as solenoids so take a look in this schematic you'll see right over here looks like little coils and some iron core right here these fuel injectors we use electromagnetic field energized from this coil to move a pintle a plunger goes up and down and that lets fuel into the engine uh, it could be air it could be fuel it could be a transmission fluid uh, it could be an actuator like a door lock we're moving a plunger an arm so solenoids um, come in various types and sizes uh, but basically the heart of it is electromagnetism from that coil <clears throat> again we send currents to that coil and that's going to create that electromagnetic field so they use power in the ground to operate those relays um, <clears throat> talked a little bit about these before you worked with worked on them in your earlier modules these components are basically both a switch right here and a coil used together they utilize the electromagnetic field to close the contacts allowing current to flow so again I run current through this coil that's going to build a magnetic field and that's going to pull the switch closed and that sends current down this side of the circuit okay so you have this is a load circuit and this is the control circuit because this is what controls this load side this goes down to whatever component you're trying to operate so small amount of current controls a large amount of current use these uh, mainly for computers so they can operate large current components and also so they can turn on those components you know a computer can't physically flip a switch but it can use a transistor to operate this coil to build a magnetic field to close a switch to send current and power to the component you want to turn on so we'll talk more about diagnosing those later as well here is a circuit from a relay kind of shows you the difference here's old school switch power source from the battery turns a switch on this is load to ground 20 amps comes through the lights turns them on old school circuit one uh, kind of more modern circuit you have battery through a fuse going down to this relay this is a five pin relay here uh, this 12 volt source goes through your headlight switch again but now it can be a much smaller switch because all we're doing is using a quarter of the amps coming quarter amp coming through here to power this coil this builds electromagnetic field to ground so it's a tiny little current circuit here this magnetic field closes the switch sends all those 20 amps down to the headlights and again this allows us to use a small switch it allows us to save copper it allows us to use a computer to operate the circuit all right <clears throat> a quick tech tip on this one if you hear the relay clicking then you know that this control side right here 
is good with the coil because it takes a magnetic field to make it click. Now the click doesn't mean the relay is good, it just means that the control side here is working. So you would focus your energy on this side over here, the load side. All right, next up we got two wire sensors. Basically we got, uh, they come in fixed resistors. Here's a schematic for that. Thermal variable resistors, known as thermistors, right here, just has an arrow through it. And then another one I want to talk about is variable reluctance sensors, or VRS, or VSS signals, vehicle speed sensors, wheel speed sensors, variable reluctance sensors, VR sensors, a uh, lot of nomenclature about these, but basically little pickup sensors, reluctance sensors we'll talk more about. Okay, so <clears throat> fixed resistors basically used to limit current in a circuit or divide a circuit for inputs and or testing. They're internal to the PCM in this case. Um, I'm going to kind of show you this picture on the right first. So in this ECU, we have 5 volts coming out of this regulator. goes through this 4 ohm resistor and then down to a switch. And then the switch goes to ground. So you're thinking, it's kind of an interesting circuit. The switch goes nowhere. Well, actually, this switch could be like a door switch, door jar switch. When you open the door, this switch can close. And that <coughs> then right here... Basically, the computer is going to see that this, this loaded resistor right here protects the computer. And then right here, you can't see it, we'll talk about it later, there's a voltmeter in the computer. It's monitoring voltage. When this switch is open, it's going to have 5 volts through this resistor right here. When the switch is closed, it'll be 0.1 or less. So we're using this fixed resistor to kind of divide the circuit or protect the circuit for testing. And you kind of see that over here as well in these pictures. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, here again, we use fixed resistors to simplify wiring. So think right here, you have cruise control switches. Uh, on your steering wheel, you have you know volume up, volume down, radio switches. All those switches, and it uses a couple wires. What they do is they use different size resistors. So when you push a switch, it's going to bypass to that size resistor. So if you look, it's coming through here. And if I hit plus resume right here, it's going to go through that resistor over to here, then out. But if I hit cancel, it has to go through all the resistors to cancel and then up and down and out. So you'll see this ground signal right here, go through all the resistors to the computer. Larger volt drop, computer knows that you're pushing on the cancel button or switch. So again, we'll use fixed resistors to simplify wiring. This is one of the few times I would use an ohmmeter. Uh, again, I, I don't use an ohmmeter very often because it checks the static circuit where you want to check a dynamic circuit. You want current running through the circuit to check it. Uh, that's where we use voltage drops, but in this situation here, I would use an ohmmeter. And, of course, we have variable resistors. Uh, these are used to adjust resistance in a circuit. We call them thermistors. The computer uses this voltage differential, these calculations, to determine engine temperature. So they have a, a table, a mapping. If you take a look at <coughs> excuse me, these temperature sensors down here, they use these variable resistors based on temperature of the engine. They change resistance. Um, negative temperature coefficient typically uh, basically means as the engine heats up, these resistances go down. So if you have a PTC resistor, positive temperature coefficient, resistance increases with heat. That's pretty normal. But these sensors are opposite. Resistance goes down with heat. So they're negative temperature coefficient. Uh, I know it's, that seems a lot. It's confusing. We'll talk about it more. But basically, that computer, this is how the computer has its uh, senses to find out what the engine temperature is. So this resistance changes, and in the computer, here's a fixed resistor. Remember we were talking about before? We have 5 volt regulator, goes to the fixed resistor, and before it went to the switch. Remember when this was a switch, that door jar switch? Yeah. So if I open or close a switch, this little squiggly line, that is a voltmeter in the computer. If the switch was open, it would read 5 volts. If the switch was closed, remember it read 0.1 or less. Okay, so because it was close to ground. Well, this is a variable resistor, so it isn't really 5 or 0.1. It's something in between. Because as this resistance gets lower, it's getting closer to a wire, so it becomes more of a ground, which means this voltage over here gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The more resistance this has, the more it's like an open which gets closer to 5 volts. So this computer will read a very variable voltage based on the variable resistance here to determine engine temperature. Uh, tech tip, we use these voltage readings to determine fault. So I would, <clears throat> excuse me, back probe right here, check for 0.1 or back probe right here. Let's, in the next video,